Hello. As part of um, the attempt to understand Zimbowska's poetry better, um, I decided to explore um, the history of Poland um, in order to contextualize some of the poems in um, her collection, View with a Grain of Sand. So, um, so here are some things and some ideas that I found through research on Poland. So apparently Poland's written history begins with the reign of Mieszko I, who accepted Christianity for Poland in AD 966. So the year 966 is quite important for Polish national identity. Um, and the Polish state reached its peak under the uh, Jagiellonian dynasty, um, following the union with Lithuania in 1386. Um, so the monarchy survived many upheavals, but eventually declined and was finally divided by Prussia, Russia and Austria in 1795. And of course, uh, Poland was later occupied by the Nazis, uh, Germany, and also um, by Stalin's Russia later. So... Um, What's notable, of course, is that in 1978, the Bishop of Krakow, now Krakow was where Zimbabwe lived, it used to be the royal capital, um, so the Cardinal, or the Bishop of Krakow, became Pope John Paul II, head of the Roman Catholic Church. And, of course, Polish Catholics rejoiced at the elevation of a Pole, a Polish person, to um, the papacy, and um, there was a lot of emotional um, uh, outpouring in the June 1979 visit to Poland. So, so Roman Catholicism is also another feature of Poland. Um, and in December 1989, um, there was a government reform program to transform the Polish economy from centrally planned to free market. And the constitution was amended to eliminate references to the leading role of the Communist Party and rename the country the Republic of Poland. Um, and apparently the Communist Party was dissolved by itself in January 1990 um, to give way to a new party called the Social Democracy of the Republic of Poland. Most of the property of the former Communist Party was um, apparently turned over to the state. And actually, this accounts for how there aren't that many oligarchs compared to Russia, for instance. So, um, Poland, of course, has conducted elections. Um, but recently, from a BBC report, it seems that um, a new nationalist Poland has come into conflict with the European Union, even though it became uh, an EU member um, some years ago, and also a NATO member. So, these are new developments that have something to do with the resurgence of Polish identity, which is a cultural topic in Poland. Now, according to the London School of Economics professor Anita Prasmalska, um, she pointed out that uh, it was the communists' aim to modernize Poland's economy and social structure. Um, she doesn't flinch from viewing the Polish communist government as imposed by Moscow, but she does show that Moscow was sensitive to the Polish situation not only in 1956 but also in 1970 and even 1981 and Gorbachev was important especially in 1989. Um, Poland was recognized as different from other communist states. Um, it was um, distinguished by its state supported but, but not collectivized agriculture it had a somewhat arrestive working class, a distinct private sector, an imposing Roman Catholic Church, and continuous contact with the West. 
So the decades of communist rule are marked by a significant Polish difference um, and of course also the Communist Party's internal decay and increasing irrelevance to Polish life. Now, Szymborska though, um, apparently was a socialist, realist author in the beginning um, of her career, later repudiated that communist artist mental and but subsequently because i think um the non-communist government that came on afterwards was somewhat corrupted um she was supposedly a supporter of the return of uh, elements of the communist party so so i think she has a complex relationship with um communism in poland so so there is of course a very complex history um, um, in Poland itself a, a, a very difficult relationship with Germany and also with Russia often in fact characterized as a kind of post-colonial or colonial relationship and in this regard um, three Polish academics um, from the University of Krakow, the Polish Academy of Sciences and the University of Warsaw discuss how Polish politics is in fact culture-centered and this is an interesting article entitled The Roots of Polish Culture-Centered Economics Towards a Non-Purely Cultural Model of Cultural Domination in Central and Eastern Europe. So um, they start by saying that it's a common thesis that Central and Eastern Europe is obsessed with culture um, and its diverse forms such as nationalism, identity politics, historical memory. These are like ghosts, you know, that have been repressed and that have come back to haunt the political scene of different countries in, the, in Eastern Europe, especially Poland. Um, and of course, questions of national identity, the role of the Catholic Church in the political sphere, um, the symbolic um, others such as Jews, Russians or Westerners, these are significant topics or of debate for Polish intelligentsia. Uh, there is ironically a striking absence of economic disputes in the Polish political scene. This may have something to do with the aversion to discussing economics since they went through a communist phase in which everything was basically about economics. Um, so the dominant type of historical explanation is also culture focus. Of course, it, it's based on the assumption that some cultural patterns possess historical inertia, narratives, myths, and so on, which when introduced into the public sphere, keep reproducing themselves over generations. So, so that's how they keep going. Um, and in this particular article, uh, they used the uh, sociologist Pierre Bourdieu's uh, theory of the field of power. Now, Bourdieu's uh, field of power is a concept that comprehends power relations in general instead of just the ruling class. Um, and the field of power is defined as the space of the relations of force between the different kinds of capital or more precisely, between the agents who possess the sufficient amount of one of the different kinds of capital to be in a position to dominate the corresponding field. Now, what this means, of course, is that um, there is, uh, to put it in, in a simple way, uh, of an arena in which different forces compete for influence. And Bourdieu shows that in Western countries, the main struggles take place between economic and cultural capital temporal versus spiritual power and capitalists or industrialists versus intellectuals or artists. In other words, the field of power is a field extended between the upper parts of the economic and cultural fields, i.e. their dominant parts, and other fields in the middle, political, bureaucratic, juridical, scientific or academic, artistic and so on. So power itself is relational, it's not a thing held by a given class or the elite. 
Uh, instead, as Bourdieu suggests, social positions in any field, and especially in the field of power, can be built on different types of capital, including economic, social, and cultural capital. So, in the Western European context, um, there is uh, what what's called a homology, which is which is kind of like a parallel or an analogy, which typically translates the structure of the field of power, which Bourdieu identified as based on an opposition between economic and cultural capital into um, the classical opposition of left wing versus right wing in politics. So, so the left pole or the left wing is homologous to the cultural capital pole of the field of power, while the right wing is homologous to the economic capital pole in the field of power. So hopefully that helps to um, clarify or map onto some existing um, binary pair. So um, there is a bit of a colonial colonizer versus colonized division um, because arguably you could, I mean one could say that there's a collaborative camp representing or working in the interests of the external dominant actors, for example during the Soviet era, the so-called Soviet nomenklatura uh, in the communist spirit, or in the post-communist spirit, the Western capitalists, versus a resisting camp. So this division um, is based on an attitude towards an external dominating force, um, the so-called colonizer. Now, of course, in this case, the role of the colonizer, the representatives of the dominant empires, um, is a little bit different and it's much more restricted than in typical colonies because in the case of Russian Poland, in contrast to German Africa, most of the jobs within the state apparatus and public institutions were filled by Poles rather than Russians. Um, though these organizations were integrated into the Russian state structure. So the contrast between the colonizers and the colonized was not as obvious, uh, probably also due to the lack of racial differences. So that's an interesting point that I think we need to remember because later we'll be talking about how in the internal debate in Poland, there is an attempt to try to um, apply post-colonial theory a la Edward Said, which has many problems, but also raises interesting um, issues and illuminates Poland's situation um, in a very acute manner. So, so a new Polish state, in other words, um, emerged in the 20th century, especially in the latter half, um, and there was the domination of the intelligentsia over the nobility and the bourgeoisie. So, so that situation um, that raised um, or elevated the importance of the intelligentsia um, is very much um, apparent in the second half of the 20th century and arguably today. Um, so, according to this Polish academics, Poland can be characterized by its traditional, by the traditionally dominant role of cultural capital in the social hierarchy. And this privileged role of cultural capital, in fact, was largely restricted during the communist period, especially in the Stalinist decade. But it was clearly important before and continues to be so after communism. So, so there are key differences, according to, to the Polish writers, between intellectuals and the intelligentsia. Um, apparently, intelligentsia is a much broader category and may be seen not just as a social group, but rather an independent class or stratum. So its coherence is based on the possession of a large amount of elite cultural capital at the same time, it shares a specific post-gentry ethos, so it has aristocratic links, in other words, 
that may not be restricted to the valuation of formal education. So the Polish intelligentsia maintains a strong family continuity with the nobility, especially of the lower ranks, but is usually distinguished from the role of an intellectual, typically that's an individual thing, an individual vocation. But an intelligentsia forms a dense network of family, friends, and other informal relations. So it's more a group or background characterization uh, rather than an individual vocation. So a clear contrast between a Polish intel intelligentsia member and a typical German bourgeoisie um, is that um, the German has membership in an informal social seat. Uh, the, the German emphasizes more the importance of formal education and material wealth, but the Pole values membership in an informal social circle or gentry genealogy. So that's the difference. Um, in the Polish case, of course, national demands were present throughout the 19th century and intelligentsia cultural activity um, was rewriting some of the national myths and forming them into a new popular Polish identity based on memories of the greatness of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So that was a kind of, in the Polish imagination, a golden age. And, and significantly, this role of the intelligentsia um, continues. Um, and I think it's probably fair to say that Zimbowska would be considered a member of the intelligentsia. Now, the ideal Polish citizen, in fact, is supposedly an intelligentsia member of gentry origin, or one who fully adopted the idealized gentry ideals and post-gentry lifestyle, a democratic nobleman with social sensitivity and a sense of patriotic duty. So this is a key determinant of the culture-focused nature of Polish political life up to today. So, and, and this, this vision, I think, um, is probably useful for understanding Zimbowska. So, so interestingly, the relations of econom economic power in Poland, they are largely hidden. And in fact, they are exercised by international companies and Western governments because, because the private sector is dominated by foreign interests. But the civic sector is overwhelmed by cultural matters. Um, and, and that's an interesting situation because it's almost like the communists in Poland just kind of surrendered. Um, so, so the key role of the intelligentsia identity as the model of the ideal Polish citizen, um, actually, um, a major part of this elite was recruited from uh, the pre-war leftist intelligentsia uh, when the communists came on, uh, but. The communists declared that they were building a specific social system composed of two non-antagonistic social classes, the working class and the peasantry, as well as one more, namely the intelligentsia, the working intelligentsia. So that's how the communists um, sort of rationalized the situation. And so in this indirect way, the privileged role of the intelligentsia was institutionalized, even though the communists uh, even though communist Poland was supposedly established as a classless society. Even under communism, Poland wasn't really classless. Um, so the intelligentsia identity became a key political tenet. Okay, so, so that's, that's um, quite significant. And of course, then there was um, the Solidarity Movement, which was anti-communist. And, and the success of that solidarity movement, um, its effect on the labor movement and the Catholic Church, and its successful 
delegitimization of the communist um, bureaucracy um, was ultimately to represent the ethos and identity of the intelligentsia. In other words, the resurgence of the intelligentsia of the Polish type. Okay, so so there were waves of liberalization, of course, um, during and after uh, Polish communism. Um, and what's interesting is that the feel of power of post-communist Poland, so that's that's the Bordeaux um, concept, the feel of power of post-communist Poland, uh, actually bears a resemblance to uh, its earlier incarnation in the interwar period. So it's got a weak pole of local economic capital related to the underdeveloped peripheral nature of the economic system and large-scale foreign ownership. Um, so it's the intelligentsia or the elite of cultural capital which has assumed a central role in the field of power. Okay, so this situation is even more acute in post-communist Poland than in the Second Republic of the interwar period. So, because the position of the indigenous economic elite is, is feeble, uh, according to, to this Polish article. Because the business class is insignificant, and Polish businesses are small, are SMEs basically, and, and the large companies are state controlled. So, so, there isn't much of a native capitalist class. This, of course, makes the managerial class more significant and the managerial class seems to rely on the values of the intelligentsia as a means of shaping the upper class status. So the field of power is dominated by the cultural capital elite, um, so which is in turn internally divided by orientation towards external powers such as being pro-European Union or anti-European Union. So, so with Poland's accession to the European Union in 2004 and gradual integration in the global economic, sy uh, economic system, so, so this relationship to the West um, is even more important nowadays. And I think for Sergei Zimbowska, it's probably true to say that, I mean, she did translate French poetry, so, so I think she's one of the, one of the cultural elites. And of course, her own poetry is important, and having won the Nobel Prize, you know that that certainly puts her um, up there in Polish culture, uh, together with um, uh, the best, together with people like Marie Curie, you know, who won the Nobel Prize, uh, who was also Polish, and who won the Nobel Prize for for science, okay, for physics. So. So field analysis of the Bourdieu type brings into consideration a broader context. It stresses intra-elite struggle over different types of capital and transnational field relationships analogous to forms of colonialism, first by the former Soviet Union and more recently by Western capitalists. So, so according to these Polish thinkers, it allows us to move beyond essentialist cultural arguments that suggests somehow Poles may be more religious or more nationalist or more preoccupied with their cultural identities than others. Um, the cultural character of contemporary Polish politics needs to be understood as one that reflects the subordinate position of the economic field rather than essentialist cultural factors. Even though there are people in Poland who argue for the importance of what seem to be essentialist cultural categories. So, so this brings me to um, another article um, which is entitled Seeking the Authentic Polish Culture and the Nature of Postcolonial Theory by Stanley Bill, which is uh, a fascinating take on the role of postcolonial theory in discussions of all things Polish. Um, again, you know, um, of course, we all start with the premise that, the, that Poland had experience of foreign occupation and domination for quite a long time. Um, in 19th and 20th centuries. So, so the post-colonial model seems applicable. And in fact, there's a Polish conservative version of post-colonial theory. Um, because uh, Poland can be regarded as having been 
conquered or colonized by the empires of Russia, Prussia, and Austria. Um, and, and subsequently by the Soviet Union. So Western European powers supposedly orientalized Polish culture in a fashion similar to um, what happened in the Middle East, as Edward Syed analyzed, feminizing Polish men and assigning a lower level of cultural development to the entire region, such that they now suffer from a typically post-colonial inferiority complex. And of course, that is conjoined with the typical messianic complex or the martyrdom complex um, that Poles supposedly have, which is that they suffer for the sake of Europe. They're like the scapegoat or the sacrificial lamb of Europe. However, what's interesting is that um, there are, of course, uh, some post-colonial concepts which could be quite illuminating. So, for example, there are concepts of mimicry and hybridity which may be relevant to the Polish case since an orientalized, denigrated and devalued Polish, Polish culture supposedly sought slavishly to mimic the patterns of its colonizers. So, giving rise to a new hybrid culture characterized by a mingling of native and foreign elements. So, so there's the question of authenticity in, the, in this case. And this hybridity and deferential mimicry is above all found supposedly in the ideology of Poland's cosmopolitan elites, which include members of the liberal ruling parties and journalists. And, and who knows, maybe they include Jim Boska in there. Because, um, because these cosmopolitan elites in Poland are, are claimed are accused of denying the native soil from which they have sprung, always looking to Western Europe and the US for cultural, political and artistic models. So, so that sounds familiar. It's a division between Creoles and natives, between those whose minds are captive to the post-colonial mentality and those who have freed themselves of it in return to an original Polishness. Now, of course, this supposedly authentic original Polishness is what is in question. And it turns out it's not so easy to find. Um, and actually, it's difficult to find examples of Polish cultural phenomena consciously mimicking Russian models, since Poles typically view themselves as superior in civilization to the barbarian Mongols to the east. Now, that's new. Um, I don't think many Singaporeans know that Russians are regarded as barbarian Mongols by Poles. So, so the so-called Creole elites look to none of the Creole elites um, apparently, uh, look to Russia for their cultural models, even though the most recent colonial experiences, Soviet and Eastern, um, the hybridized culture seems to look um, to the West. So, so that could be a problem if we are trying to apply post-colonial theory wholesale. So, and and maybe if we can't or don't apply post-colonial theory wholesale to, to Poland. Um, instead of post-colonial, which is more relevant for the third world countries, uh, some people have proposed a post-dependency term. The term post-dependency could be more appropriate to Poland. Um, because the ethical project of post-colonial redefinition of post-identity is has, has a political impetus um, because because conservatives have found, you know, this notion of Polishness conducive to the defense of traditional Catholic values and a primordialist understanding of nation against new multiculturalist, individualist and civic models of an identity. Now, if it's multiculturalist and individualist, I think that sounds like Zimboska. Um, so, so, I'm not sure that she would be comfortable with Poland these days, which seems to have decided to go a little anti-Western. So, on the um, account of Stanley Bill, the Polish landscape has um, Creoles versus natives. And Creoles are the liberal, political and 
intellectual elites supposedly ho holding themselves above um, the backward masses, whereas natives are the rest of Poland, um, whose interests are supposedly represented by the socially conservative Law and Justice Party, the Catholic Church, or uh, new nationalist groups. So, and this division between Creoles and natives is axiological. So, at least from the conservative perspective, Creoles are supposed to be self hating Poles, internally divided, pretentious, artificial, inauthentic, smitten with the West and its alien values, incapable of thinking for themselves. Lemmings quote-unquote lemmings, as the conservative press likes to label them, um, haunted by complexes resulting from a sense of inferiority um, due to Western surrogate hegemons. Whereas, natives are simple, authentic, deeply committed to Christian values, proud of their own traditions, devoid of any complexes before the West. So, this basic opposition is between the real Poland and the fake or inauthentic Poland. So that kind of reminds me a bit of how decades ago um, in China, there are these people called Jia Yang Gui Zi, you know, fake Westerners, contrasted with obviously the real Chinese people. Um, and of course, in Singapore too, there is a difference between the so-called um, authentic Singaporean who speaks Singlish and those who don't. <laughs> so, so this division seems um, quite, quite common. So post-colonial theory lends um, this opposition between alleged authenticity and inauthenticity as a, an ethical dimension and also a sense of historical telos, meaning there is an end, E-N-D, there is an end to history um, or a point, a purpose to the development of history. And the Creole elite in Poland is supposedly on the wrong side of history, trapped within a colonized mentality, whereas the masses of the Polish nation um, uh, either, you know, um, sedated or partly co colonized by Creole propaganda, must ultimately rise to reclaim their authentic identity. Um, this kind of reminds me a bit of Make America Great Again, it, because this is a, a, a conservative revolution, okay? Now, um, in 2013, which is fairly recent, um, the thinker Vivek Shiba has actually advanced the radical argument in, in his book Post-Colonial Theory and the Spectre of Capital that, in fact, such post-colonial theories particularly of the so-called subalternist school, ultimately promote an essentializing vision of culture, um, especially in the case of non-Western societies. And as such, these theories have obscured the global reach or relevance of capitalism and class. Um, so according to Shiba, the lasting contribution of post-colonial theory is in fact the revival of cultural essentialism. Now, now, what do we mean by essentialism? It's regarding things as having some kind of innate essence or an innate core, right, that is describable. Um, so, according to Shiba, post colonial theory revives cultural essentialism and actually acts as an endorsement of Orientalism rather than being an antidote to it. Now, that's a controversial claim. But um, it's got an interesting angle to it. Um, what this view says is that post-colonial theory defends the specificity of local cultures. But then when it does that, it falls into a kind of culturalism, placing illegitimate limitations on um, the range of emancipatory behaviors possible or open to individuals in specific places. So, so the emphasis on essential cultural difference um, blurs what capital and its universal power does, and it blurs the universal human needs that form the basis of any potential resistance to capital. 
Now, of course, some of you might have noticed this is a bit of a leftist perspective. But this view says that the core thesis of post-colonial studies is that there is a deep divide separating East and West, so much so that it undermines any framework that makes universal claims. So for 200 years, apparently, uh, those who call themselves progressive have actually embraced universalism. It was simply understood that workers or peasants could unite across national boundaries because they had material interests, certain material interests in common. This is being called into question by so-called subaltern studies, what Shiba calls the subalternist approach. And he find, I mean, Shiba finds it ironic that many people on the left, supposedly progressive, have actually accepted this. And, and, and this view says that actually this underestimates the universalizing power of capital. So Polish conservative theories have shown a strong interest in promoting cultural essentialism and anti-universalism since they wish to propagate a particular vision of exclusive and integral Polishness. And for many Polish conservatives, post-colonial emancipation continues to mean liberation from a dominant leftist agenda, which they still perceive in the political structures of post-1989 Poland and even of the European Union. So that's a very surprising turn of events. The Polish conservative post-colonial theory negatively confirms Schiba's hypothesis by uniting fierce anti-leftism with a powerful emancipatory political project rooted in visions of authentic culture. So, and by the way, they seem to have succeeded because the latest report was um, the Polish government actually trying to revamp the judiciary, um, which of course is contrary to what Western um, Democrats typically propose. So back, back to this so-called authentic Poland. Um, of course, different people situate the authentic Poland in different parts of Polish history. Um, for example, there is somebody called Eva Thompson who, who thinks that authentic Poland is in the pre-partition era of Sarmatianism, which is the peculiar gentry culture of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth from the 15th to 16th centuries, a kind of golden age before it went into decline in the 17th and 18th centuries. And what is this so-called Polish golden age? Well, according to Thompson, it's a an independent and self-reliant Republican culture, comfortable with itself, proud of its productions um, in different fields, not really very interested in the outside world, so somewhat insular, but um, confidently taking its place as an equal among other European cultures. And the Sarmatian era in Polish culture, however, according to Stanley Bill, in, in, in a rebuttal of this point, Sarmatian era in Polish culture was in fact characterized by a very high level of hybridity and mimicry of foreign models. Just look at the streets of Krakow, the former royal capital. Um, according to the article, the medieval core of the city was laid out according to a German framework for urban planning and legal regulation dictated by the Magdeburg rights. And many of the city's distinctive structures and interiors were built in Italian styles by Italian architects. Most Polish noblemen of the era received their education in Western Europe. Even the greatest Polish poet of the time, Jan Kuczynowski, had his university education in Prussia and Italy. So there we have it. Um, it was hybrid in the very origin of the so-called Polish Golden Age. But, of course, there are these so-called necessary fictions 
consult constructed by nations afflicted by a cultural inferiority complex myths in other words that hail an ancient and glorious past they don't necessarily exist but they are and that's why they're called myths but there's this supposed golden age which is not necessarily borne out by history now of course um, it could be that this summation myth itself um, which is of course Iranian in, in its origin actually um, is is a fictional function has a fictional function and it's in fact founded on the curious claim that Polish noblemen were descendants of an ancient Iranian tribe the ancient Iranian Sarmatian tribe and and it's very strange or interesting because this myth leads to a peculiar self orientalization the adoption of various extravagant styles of Eastern custom and dress perhaps in an attempt to define a glorious Polish historical identity separate from the dominating influence of Western European cultural forms so in other words Poland is Asianizing um, the specific content of the myth itself imposes a highly colonial interpretation of Polish history ironically because according to this an Iranian tribe swept into Slavic lands because in fact much of a Polish of the Polish population is originally Slavic swept into Slavic lands and conquered the native Slavs the native population so the ensuing divide between the ruling Sarmatian Sarmatians and the downtrodden Slavic peasantry was far more severe than any contemporary division between Creoles and natives so this raises the question of where or what the authentic Poland actually is now Stanley Bill argues that all cultures are hybridized and dynamic since no human culture has developed without any contact whatsoever with other cultures uh, but of course in the canonical post-colonial cases it is possible at least in principle to draw a clear line relatively clear line between native cultural content and the aggressive in invasions of the colonizing culture the hegemon uh, for example this is quite clear in the Americas and Australia where fully formed and developed local cultures encountered Western cultures they had never previously seen. So the same, for example, in um, China and also Singapore, where there were um, clearly formed cultures existing prior to Western content. So the line between authentic and inauthentic content in the post-colonial context of contemporary Australian Aboriginal cultures, for instance, is, is relatively easy to locate. And of course, um, in the South Asian and African spheres, um, we see varying degrees of earlier contact with European culture, so it's a little more complex. But undoubtedly, certain crucial and identifiable political, religious and economic distinctions remain. Um, so the Polish situation is nothing like any of these classic post-colonial cases. Um, from its symbolic beginnings with the baptism of Mieszko I in 966, uh, Bill argues that Polish culture has always been a hybridized culture developing under the influence of Western and Southern European colonizing influences. So in other words, it may not be very colonizing. Um, so it's a case of hybridity in the very origins of Poland. The dragging of Slavic lands along the Wata and Vistula rivers into the orbit of Western Christianity and its associated cultures. I mean, that's the beginning of Poland. And the symbolic origin of Polish nation nationhood actually lies in an act of cultural colonization willingly accepted by a tribal elite for immediate political gain. Um, hence, the adoption of the Christian religion from Rome in order to stop the aggressive intentions of the Germanic Holy Roman Empire so there was a political play so so according to this theory Miesko the first would become the first crew betraying the earlier authentic elements of his own pagan culture so there we have it <laughs> but Polish culture according to this view is still deeply scarred by this original colonial encounter with Latin civilization via a brutal conversion to Christianity. The Western Slavs lost their mythology and their cultural identity 
which was extinguished by the missionary zeal of the new cultural masters. And according to some writers or thinkers like Yanyan, for example, J-A-N-I-O-N, Yanyan, finds the traces of this deep wound in classic works of Polish literature, particularly from the Romantic era, where Slavic mythological motifs frequently appear like the return of the repressed, you know, if we put it in psychoanalytic terms. So from 966 onward, Yenin argues, Poles have been alienated from themselves, feeling inferior to the colonizing West as peripheral latecomers to Latin civilization and superior to the Slavic East. So they have a superiority complex to Russia. So the contemporary Polish imagination must struggle against the ghosts of this um, originary colonization, which then, according to Yenin, uh, express themselves in the messianism of national megalomania. Well, that's a phrase for you. Messianism of national megalomania. So, um, however, in order to join Europe on equal terms, genuinely equal terms, um, this uh, restrictive monolithic identity must be cast away to embrace diversity and its own uncanny Eastern Slavicness, quote-unquote, uncanny Eastern Slavicness. In other words, uh, according to thinkers like Yenin, Poland must overcome the legacy of its original colonization by Latin Christianity. Okay? So, so that's how some people in Poland or uh, thinkers on Polish identity draw the line between authentic and inauthentic identity. So, Whereas Thompson draws the line at the close of the Sarmatian era, Yenin goes earlier back in time to the 10th century, okay, to the founding of Poland, 966. So Christianization and the beginnings of the Polish nation within the Latin Christian political system, where an alien new religion and mythology impose themselves on an authentic pre-Christian Slavic proto-Poland. That's the original authentic Poland, according to this view. But of course, this argument is primarily political rather than historical um, because history here is just a useful tool in an ideological struggle over the political and cultural shape of modern Poland. So history is being harnessed for political purposes here. And um, her account of the Latin colonization of the Western Slavs, Yenin's account, actually, according to Bill, unwittingly reproduces the narrative of Polish martyrdom and exceptionalism she appears keen to oppose, since she does not acknowledge that this history in diverse forms is common to all European nations. So Bill is making the point that actually all European nations suffered from um, the suppression or the repression of their paganism by Latin Christianity. Because all European nations have had their own pre-Christian repressed. So Europe as a whole is essentially the product of the encounter between Southern Latin Christianity with its classical civilizational foundations and different Northern and Western pagan cultures. So Poland actually came into existence relatively late on the geographical periphery of this European scene and has historically tended to be a net consumer rather than a producer of influential cultural models. So. Um, so according to Bill, we, we can only come to appreciate the originality and uniqueness of Polish cultural productions when we recognize this peripheral status. So in other words, the key trait, in fact, could be peripherality or marginalism. Okay, in the case of a Polish cultural um, identity. So the peripherality of Polish culture is inscribed into its very or origin as is colonization. And, and nothing can be separated from the symbolic moment of 966 since actually history begins or histor historiographical reflection begins with 966. So, so what do we have for, po for an authentic Poland? It is peripheral, hybridized and dynamic and its political existence has always been fragile and its participation in European culture has been characterized by um, what can be described as belatedness. Now, this reminds me of Harold Bloom's The Anxiety of Influence. So maybe what Poland suffers from is the anxiety of influence. 
this sense of belatedness, being late to arrive on the scene. Okay, so scholars and public intellectuals on both sides of Polish culture wars, unfortunately, continue their search for the authentic. Um, even though, from Bill's account, Stanley Bill's account, this search is probably futile. Okay. So, so and, and in fact, he says that there is the trap of fetishizing certain authentic visions of Polishness to the exclusion of others. So, um, the new Polish identity can be imagined to be somehow more coherent with the authentic recognition of Slavic origins. Okay, but actually this orientalizes Russia by insisting on its inferiority to a European Poland. So... So, on the one hand, while Poles should embrace their own non-European Slavic identity, um, you know, it's, an, it's a question whether or not it should then, in turn, orientalize Russia, okay, just to take its independent place among European nations. And in fact, an earlier Polish writer, Vito Gombrowicz, um, half a century earlier, in the first volume of his diary, says... Quote unquote, we will not be a truly European people until we separate ourselves from Europe because being European does not mean fusing with Europe but being one of its integral parts, a very distinct integral part. Quote unquote. So, um, and of course, um, it's quite common these days for Polish people and also non Polish um, uh, watchers of Poland to think of Poland as. East of West and West of East. East of West and West of the East. So according to Anthony Smith, the nationalist, quote-unquote, the nationalist overall aim is to ground the nation on firm and authentic foundations, to unite the community, restore its autonomy and self-expression, and in this way to prepare to take its rightful place in the concert of nations. Nothing wrong with that aim, okay? But actually, according to Smith, ethnicity provides the most typical foundation for such narratives. Um, and hence, Yenin's theory of uncanny Slavicness. Now, the danger, unfortunately, is of course this is bordering on racialism and could potentially even veer into racism. Right? So, so um, while championing a pagan Slavic origin or authenticity, um, you know, does this mean that there are exclusions, exclusions of Jews, for example, exclusions of other minorities in Poland? Okay, so, and and some people have argued that this is this is an illusion because the continuity of culture and its tropes that goes beyond any economic, political, or social changes. This is a kind of culturalism. It's an essential. It's a, it's a subset of essentialism. Um, of course, in a very different context, such as the culturally pluralist USA, um, it's possible to argue that the question of which culture we belong to is relevant only if culture is anchored in race. So, in such a situation, there is an ultimate grounding on the assumption of essential racial distinctions. Okay, so so the supposed progressive ethos of cultural pluralism is at heart a racialist doctrine, according to this view, since it's, a, it's the appeal to race that makes culture an object of effect and that gives notions like losing our culture, preserving it, stealing someone else's culture, restoring people's culture to them, and so on, their pathos. And of course, in this context, you know, the U.S. actually has had, uh, in current affairs, uh, various cases of so-called cultural misappropriation, you know, um, we can talk about that in a later video if, if anybody's interested. So, for example, there was a report um, of an American girl wearing a, a qi pao, you know, a Chinese dress, um, to uh, her prom, and then this raised a bit of a storm about whether this was cultural misappropriation. I mean, some people would just regard it as a compliment, you know, that you're interested enough to wear the dress or the attire of a different culture. but. In the U.S., it's an issue because because of the um, ethnic um, origin or the ethnic link to culture. Okay, so so the focus on race may 
in fact, obscure the operation of economic inequality across racial boundaries. So the universalism of economic inequality can be blurred by this emphasis on ethnic and cultural boundaries, is the point. So, and, and because it's so cultural, culture-specific, it raises the question of, you know, whether, for example, in Poland, the Jews have the same right to this culture because, because it would apparently not be the case because the Sarmatian myth is hard to imagine without Catholicism in its background, and of course that excludes Jews, right? So, so, so maybe Polish culture should be defined as a linguistic territory, you know, as those who speak the language. But then, of course, it's a problem because there are Poles who, are, who maybe live outside Poland and, and maybe don't really speak the language anymore, but are still identify as Polish. So it's, it's a bit of a complicated problem. Um, so, and, and in fact, in, 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 in Poland, uh, people have noted that um, there are mixed emotions of superiority and inferiority towards Jews, that, that Poles have this paradoxical attitude towards Jews. You know, they feel both inferior and superior to Jews. And, and who knows whether or not that could be linked to anti-Semitism, uh, which has, in Europe, reared its ugly head again in the 21st century. So, so there's this cultural unconscious of so-called uncanny Slavicness, which is a hidden call of ethnic origin. And it's returning... Uh, according to some accounts like a collective repress in literature and art so so that's something to be alert to and and by the way young poles actually have emigrated after the opening of the european job markets in fact when i was in london a few years ago i i i, I think i was served by poles actually in the british museum um in and and different cafes uh certainly eastern europeans um so so, after, so this economic migration um, really has an economic explanation. Um, but sometimes, by certain Polish thinkers, this is couched in cultural rather than economic terms. So Stanley Bill points this out, and I think it's, an, it's, it's quite an acute point. Um, but then, of course, this, this refusal to look at economics it could be a historically determined aversion to Marxist thought since death had an overdose of that. And so post-colonial theory turns out to be at odds with leftist intellectual traditions of universalism and the defense of class interests across cultural boundaries. And so post-colonial theory seems to offer a ready-made instrument for the conservatives who may want to pursue exclusionary and essentialist visions of authentic culture against universalist claims, including those based on Marxist understandings of capitalism or class. So in post-communist Poland, everything's a bit of a complicated soup now. Um, um, even though the conservatives seem to have um, won some eminence recently, um, it's, it hasn't been easy to forge a vision of culture and society independent of ethnicity. Or, or this essence of ethnicity which lies in imagined ties of ancestry and kinship that stretch back all the way into the midst of history. Um, so ethnic Poles, so-called imagined descendants of the West Slavic tribes, um, you know, um, may or may not embrace hybridity and abandon the claims of authentic culture. I mean, Stanley Bill raises this this rhetorical question, will Poles embrace hybridity and, embra and abandon the claims of authentic culture? And I think recent events, at least in the political arena, seem to suggest the answer maybe is no. And so maybe this is Poland's vision of make Poland great again. Who knows? But in any case, I think um, uh, as far as Zimboska is concerned, I she doesn't seem to wade very deeply into all of this, but it's uh, especially the more recent stuff um, on on Polish ethnicity and the Sarmatian vision and so on. Um, but I think it's it's quite interesting to see this as a broader context to her poetry. Thank you. Bye.